really excited about this week's podcast. I'm going to say Mr. Nitrovol is in the house. <laughs> Tony's in the house. Tony was the person who was running performance at the Queensland Reds many years ago. Yeah, a lot of years ago now. Yeah, and he called me up one day and said, mate, I love creatine, I love glutamine, I love protein, I love all these things you make, but geez, can you make it in one product? So we went up there and we made Nitrovol. Good to have you on board. Thanks, mate. I think that's a fairly abbreviated story. It, it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, you guys came to us and you had a couple of awesome products, I remember. And the way you tell it, I didn't want to mix them. But the reality <laughs> was, for me, I didn't want a culture of our young athletes just taking a lot of different supplements. So for them to get one dosage with everything in it was yeah. just, that was outstanding for yeah. me. And that's how Nitrovile was born. Let's rip in. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast, bringing you everything you need, want, and should know about health, fitness, nutrition, and training. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. This podcast was brought to you by the newest product to enter the body science performance range, Myocytin. Independent research-proved body science Myocytin to outperform standard creatine. In only six days, athletes ingesting Myocytin gained more than twice as much body mass as those consuming regular creatine. Athletes also increased upper arm girth by over 200% more than regular creatine users and improved their bench press performance significantly more than users of regular creatine. Ask your local supplement retailer how to get yours. Welcome to Body Science HQ, the world of fit, happy, and healthy. And I'm going to add on the end of this one, performance lab guru, somebody I met at the Queensland Reds. What did, when was that? That would have been back in. Mate, that was mid to late 90s. 90s, yeah. yeah. Jeez. Got an old age to it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems like five years ago, but apparently it, it it's does, not. Yeah, I've, people say, "Okay, Nitrovol's been around a little while. It's been around forever." <laughs> it was a product that came from you, and it's it's a really cool story that we still tell today. And that's one of the great things about being involved in sport. You, you not only build the relationships and and you get to meet great people. We've actually done a lot of product development through sport, and like you just mentioned on the intro there, that was about simplification and safety for athletes, and that was something you were always about back then. Yeah, absolutely. Just trying to make it as easy as possible to perform at your best every day. And if we reduce some of that input, some of that friction from, you know, I, I can't guarantee you that an athlete will take three or four supplements, but yeah. I can probably guarantee they'll take one. Yeah. And if there's one with everything in it that we need, then that's gold. Yeah. And it, it's been, it's probably one of our longest serving products now and I should say thanks for that. Hey, no problem. It was no. accidental, but no yeah. problem. <laughs> so you've left the world of sport and you had a great career too. You, you mucked around with the Reds. Who else did you play with? Yeah. So I worked with most of our Queensland based teams. So mm. the Reds, uh, the Broncos did not work with AFL, then worked uh, with Olympic athletes as yeah. well. So track athletes, beach volleyball, uh, I got to work over in the States with some major league baseball teams and How's some that? colleges. Oh, incredible. If you're interested in sport, America is the pinnacle. Yeah. You know, it's really hard to compare any other country to what they do in sport. And there's a lot of people that, you know, that's really not their thing. But if you really want to see the absolute pinnacle of sport, that's it. There's almost no denying it. Yeah. And were they tens of years in front of us as far as sports performance went? Interestingly, they were, you know, centuries in front of us in spending money. Mm -hmm. but not necessarily that far in front of us in sports science, supplements, all those sorts of things. Okay. And almost, you know, here in Australia, almost out of necessity, you want to make sure that what you have works. Whereas over there, they have so much money. They just throw money at a problem. It may get fixed. It may not. Um, I remember back when I was involved over there, Australian sports scientists were really, really well regarded. Okay. And actually, a lot of them were sort of regarded as being a bit ahead of the uh, their American counterparts like and probably just for that reason. Yeah, nice. Did you spend a long time in the US in sport? Not a long time. So I went over there quite a few times, but they were all pretty short stints. So yeah. I might be at spring training with a with a team or pre-season with a college team or something like that. So I didn't spend a whole lot of big chunks of time over there, but a lot of short periods. And how good is their college's system over there? Mate, it, I enjoyed the college system more than the professional system, is to be right? honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, the atmosphere at something like a college football game is incredible. you got 100,000 people people there and everyone is really invested in it. Like yeah. you're either a student, an old boy of the school, or your grandfather went there. So you have a really close association with it, which makes the atmosphere incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And you've taken that skill set and you've you created Performance Lab? Yep, my yeah, my company. So do you want to tell us a little bit about Performance Lab? Yeah, 
Yeah, so, you know, I hit a point in my career where I was able to do some really great things in sport, uh, but I was also, I also experienced a lot of the downsides of sports as well, you know, especially as a, as an assistant coach, like as a support staff coach. They always say there's two types of coaches, coaches that have been fired and coaches that are going to get fired. Um, so I <laughs> felt- a great profession. <laughs> yeah, I fell on uh, both sides of that. Yeah. And I- uh, it kind of got to the point where I was no longer in control of what I, of my future, you know, I could do a brilliant job, but if a head coach got fired, there's a good chance they'll bring their own support staff in. Yeah, gotcha. I had young kids at the time and and I no longer really wanted to move around too much. Uh, in Brisbane, there's really only four jobs that I can do. That's mm-hmm. it. Um, I'd already done three of them. Uh, and so mate, I did not know what was next, had no idea. And I went with my wife one night to a uh, information night on an MBA at the University of Queensland and just thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and do that with no idea of where it's going to lead, but just as a broad sort of uh, platform to do something else. Uh, then I was, it was in my, one of my final years at the Queensland Bulls and one of the sponsors came and asked me to run a session with their leadership team on building team culture and managing people effectively. And so I went and did that and then turns out that's a thing that people do for a living. I didn't even know this, right? <laughs> and I was just really lucky from there sort of word of mouth started to spread and I started doing a lot more of that kind of corporate stuff. And at the end of the day, I was most interested in, we have all of these athletes in different sports and you know different teams. And at the end of the day, really from a fitness, strength, decision-making, skill point of view, they're all pretty close. You yeah, know? Okay. They're probably within one or 2% of each other. So what is the thing that helps teams or athletes outperform other teams or athletes based on the fact that a lot of that raw talent is the same. I got really interested in that. And then so I went to work in the corporate world, working with leaders and teams around that, and then eventually working with staff on just that element of how do we manage ourselves every day? How do we show up every day and do great work and do it all without burning out? So that's what I got super interested in. And did you find the corporate athlete very similar to the traditional field athlete as far as the approach to every day? Probably at the highest level. So if you have a really high level business owner, CEO, in a lot of ways, yes, without the emphasis on recovery and downtime. So everyone wants to go really hard all the time. In sports, you simply can't do that because it's physical. But in work, you feel you can do that. Uh, And while most of the research tells us you actually can't, you know, that's generally what they were trying to do. And in a lot of ways in, you know, setting goals in, I guess, tricks to sort of stay motivated, having good routines, the really good ones were doing that. But funnily enough, once you got under that sort of senior manager level, no one else in the organization is doing it. And so you have all of this untapped potential in the organization because you have these people who are who really ha- do not have any idea about managing themselves every day. And they end up just turning up and going through the motions. And that's one, bad for business, obviously. But it's two, it's not great for the individual either. No, exactly. You know? Exactly. So mate, talking about leadership and performance, do you find most of your value is in the team structure of a corporate or at the high end board level like where 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 can you make the most change so i most like it's a bit of a two part question yep. um i most enjoy working with kind of middle management yep. and just because they can have the biggest impact yep. they have the the biggest reach to the most number of people having said that for that to be most effective i need senior management to have bought into that as yep. well so i need to do the work at that level to get them to buy in and then most of the work at the next level just so they can affect more people. Like at the end of the day, my mission in the work that I do is just to affect as many people as I possibly can, positively affect as many people as I can. And to do that, I either go straight to the people or I try to get the people that manage the most number of people. Yeah. Okay. And using the example of a forwards coach or a backs coach, you know, obviously there's a different skill set. They both play the same game. Do you have the same theories at corporate with that middle management and that upper management as to the the way you talk about leadership and performance? Very similar in, you know, I think in sport, a lot of things are easier. We, we talk about this concept of creating clarity, right? And that could be clarity around what we need to do to succeed. It could be clarity around what success actually looks like. It could be clarity around the culture that we want and 
therefore what behaviors we choose every day. So in sports, a lot of that is pretty kind of self-determining. Like it's fairly obvious. It's obvious what we're trying to achieve. We're taught those technical skills to do it. So it becomes a lot easier. In the workplace, when we're trying to create clarity around those things, and often for a vast number of people, that's the thing that becomes really difficult. How do we get people to understand, one, what we're trying to achieve, two, the things that they do that make them most valuable in achieving that, three, the culture that we're trying to create, and then number four, how do we kind of keep that front of mind and how do we help people show up and do that every day? Yeah, nice. I like that word clarity you just used too because you didn't use the word communicate, you didn't use use the word clarity, which is, I guess, the end goal of everything that, because if you've got clarity, you, you've got the vision, you've got where everything's going. I, I do like that. I haven't had a lot of people come here and use that word yeah. when they're talking about, especially leadership and, and working in that corporate space. I like that. Yeah. Well, the clarity, clarity has everything else you talked about rolls up into that, mm. right? To get clarity, I have to communicate well. I have to be clear on what my vision or what my strategy is. Now, I don't just have to communicate well. Everything that we do in so far as systems, processes, recognition, reward, holding people accountable has to support what I'm saying. And if all of those things aren't in alignment, then people are likely to go, you know what? They say that this thing's important, but then they show me something completely different. Yeah. And that's one thing that people just cannot stand. You know, And whether that's in a sporting team or the workplace, it's one thing that people see and they disengage from that very quickly. Do, do you think the background in sport was a real positive for you leading into where you are with Performance Lab? Yeah, I think so. And I think more and more as we, you know, as we kind of do a lot with leadership, but then step out of that into kind of personal performance, I think it gets even more important, you know, mm-hmm. like just that ability to manage ourselves really well, our ability to stay motivated, our ability to stay on track. One of the, the big things that we constantly talk about when we talk about high performance, we often talk about it at a behavioral level. Everyone has their own outcomes, you know, like body science has its own outcomes that represent high performance. If I go and work with a law firm, they have their outcomes. But a behavioral level, high performance is really just doing the harder thing when the harder thing gets us a better result in the future. Yep. Right. And if we can get people to do, and that's a difficult thing to do, but if we can get people to do that through creating clarity and leading them well, and then teach the people the skills to be able to do that all the time for themselves, that's when we get a really great organization. And that's what good athletes have to do, right? They have to work out what that harder thing is and keep doing that. And when that becomes comfortable and becomes the easier thing, now they've got to find the next harder thing, right? And all our value that we create as, you know, in relationships, in the workplace, um, as athletes, as teams, all comes from our ability to do the harder thing. Yeah, nice. So I want to rip into motivation and goals soon because that's what one of your your loves. Yeah, so absolutely. But before we go there, you've actually got a journal that works this process along with it. How do we get that? At performancelab.com.au. The journal is called the Focus Planner. There's just a Focus Planner tab there. Just click onto that and you'll you'll see it there. What the planner does is it's a daily reminder to do the harder thing. Yep. That's what it is. So it breaks your day down into what are the three most important work tasks, right? So that, which makes me think immediately, what's, what's all the noise I get versus what are the things that really matter? Okay. okay. Then there's a section there that says to positively impact home and relationships, this is what I'm going to do. Because we know that performance in the workplace or in anything really is also a function of our performance in other areas of our lives as well. Absolutely. So really honing in on that kind of what do I, what can I do today to sort of make that better? And then there's a self section as well to positively impact self, which is our own physical, mental, emotional well-being, our own personal achievements. You know, what am I going to do to positive, positively impact that? What am I going to do to recharge? There's a gratitude piece at the end. So every day you fill this thing out and it can be one or two words. It doesn't really matter, but it's just about making sure that the behaviors you choose throughout the day are really intentional. You know, I think the vast majority of us, we show up every day, we wake up, get into work, and we just do what's in front of us. Yeah. You know, we just become really reactive. We're almost just, we're on autopilot for most of the day, as opposed to if we sat back and if we we're a bit more intentional about the behaviors we choose, we probably wouldn't choose to do half the things that we do during yeah. the day, right? We'd pick other things that help us get closer to those goals or represent doing the harder thing. So I'm just going to call that soulless goals. Like it's just things you know you got to do, but there's no soul. So yep. how do you, as someone walking into a business that might have 5, 10, 20, 30 people, change that motivation piece? Like I can only imagine that it would be a highly rewarding feeling. Yeah. But that aside, to come into a company, do you do you have to spend a lot of time? Obviously, when you play footy, and I'll go back to that analogy all the time. You have a preseason, 
you've got someone doing rehab, you know, injury report, you know all that. You go into this business and you've got the me or the director or the whatever telling you what's wrong with the business. And we both know that we're out of touch 90% of the time on what that really is. We have our beautiful belief on what we think it should be and all that. And the reality is the scope you get given is probably 40% right. So how do you come into a team of people and start talking motivation and goals? And I know one of the things you talk about is we're hardwired to not be motivated for long-term goals, yet most people aren't looking to change their job tomorrow. Yes. So how do you attack that? It's an interesting question. So usually I will, so in, in a brief for a job, I'll obviously talk to the manager or the MD or whoever, yeah. Yeah, CEO or whoever the person is that's directly in charge of the team that I'm working with. The second person I will talk to is that person's EA. Yeah. They usually have the best handle on what is going on in the business, yeah, right? Point. So that's where I kind of start. Secondly, as much as I'd like to say that I get a, you know, uh, I spend hours trying to work out what's going on in every business, a lot of the problems are the same. A lot of the problems are very, very much the same. And that is, so back to the, the original point, people spend a lot of time on things that don't always make a difference, yep. you know? And, you know, once again, not great for the business, not great for people's achievement and fulfillment and their sense of worth. So then it's about how do I get people to understand some of that and then work out why it's happening. And when I say that they're not, they don't work on the things that really matter or they work on things that don't really matter either way, you find that that bleeds into all parts of people's lives, right? You find that they often do it at work, but they'll often do it in their relationships as well. And they'll often do it in their own personal endeavors. And so once you get people to understand that, then they have a better shot at trying to correct it. You know, there's there's, there's a few reasons people don't change. Number one is they're unaware. Number two, they're unwilling. And number three, they're unable. Most people actually fall into the unaware bit, okay. right? I don't know. I don't either don't realize who I've become. So I say that people are really out of touch with who they are and also who they want to be. So people are often, they they have this identity that it often isn't true. And then they also haven't stopped to think about who they really want to be. And once we can create that kind of gap between where I am now and where I'd like to be, that's where we can start to make some change and get some learning. And do, do you have a lot of change issues there when you start talking to people like that? Because we've all got business with new people. We've all got businesses with older pops. We've all got pe- business with long-termers. Like they might not be old, but they might have been with you for 10 years. And so you come in externally and someone above them says, we need some change or we need some motivation or we need some goal setting or the process needs to be looked at. D- how do you handle that that process with the individual because it's very personal where you get we've done a lot of this in our business we've had a lot of people come into the business and, and do certain aspects we, we know everybody's profiles we've got everyone into a room and walked them around profiling which was hilarious because you go that makes so much sense now why you're like <laughs> why you're like that and it's something we really believe in as a business. We, we do yeah. a lot of it. Change is a very difficult thing. And most people don't like change. You'd have some great data on all that. So how do you manage that process? I think that the biggest change I find that people fear is change in the workplace, yeah. right? So when you start to make that change more about them than the workplace, and the workplace stuff might come as a result of that, people seem to be a lot more willing for that. And the vast majority of what I do in corporate world is disguised as, hey, this is for you. Yeah. It's not for the business, right? It's going to benefit the business, obviously. Yeah. But when people understand that, then I think they're more willing to engage. Now, their level of engagement may will be at varying levels in a certain workshop or a meeting or whatever. But if I can, my job in a lot of ways is to build enough trust so that people will open up, right? So people will choose to share. Yeah. And if I can create that culture quickly within a workshop or a team meeting or whatever it is, then the rest of it tends to look after itself. And I know that's a pretty ethereal sort of answer, but it's funny. I I stumbled on really, really early. And I say stumbled on because I didn't even mean to do it. And I didn't even know I was doing it until someone broke it down for yeah. me. I stumbled on some ways to build trust really quickly with audiences and, and get them to open up. And for a while, I had no idea. I knew I could do it, but I had no idea how until someone actually sort of broke it down for me and said, this is what you should do. And I thought, well, that is actually what I do without any understanding of doing it. Yeah, nice. Is it hard to, I mean, obviously from a footy perspective, you build the trust with the players over time because you're there for them and, you, and, and you're doing the hard yards together. When you walk into a corporate, do you do you find that instantly you're not the god of trust because 
the boss is paying for you to come into this place. And so the reason I'm going on about this is I think it's really important for people to understand that performance isn't just in a gym or on a, on a sporting field. Yeah. It is it is all aspects of your life. And like you said, it's home life, it's work life, it's everything. And I don't think we do enough, like you mentioned earlier, we don't do enough monitoring of ourselves and our teams in the corporate world. Like we, yeah. we just, it's one of those things that can be put off to being too soft. Yeah. Well, that's just garbage you hear from some public speaker, but I'm, I'm a massive fan of it. And I'm, I really see the future of what I, I think sports can do really well in corporate in the future, because I think people like yourself and what you've become, you get it, you know, like yeah. you, you get everything from winning, losses, injury, and it happens here every day. You win jobs, you lose jobs, things go right. You only need one customer to come up and tell you what they think about you that's positive. Then you have one that comes up and tells you what they think about you that's not positive. Yeah. And I think it's really important to have the concept in place. And like, I know it says here that you're a, a massive process is all that matters. And I think it's really important to have people like you in businesses to understand that. But it's also for the people listening, it's, you know, working in an environment with other people, understanding that there are things that can help you, even though you're not, if you're not enjoying your work. I mean, if you line 10 people up and say, do you like your job? Nine of them say, no, I don't. You know I mean? <laughs> let, let's, let's be honest. One will lie. <laughs> and then the other four that didn't really give you an honest answer are trying to start their own business anyway. And, and they, yeah. they've got that drive and they're, they're trying to learn that. So from this perspective of processes and performance in business, it fascinates me because I, I just, we're, we're heavily DNA in sports. So we see that side and we get yeah. to meet with people like you and, and spend time with you. And then, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, you're running performance lab. And I just want to pick your brains in this podcast and go, but what does that mean? But what does that mean? And it probably sounds a little dicky on my side around <laughs> the way I'm talking. But I, what I really want to do is give that back to the, the people. And, and we've got a fitness listener that listens to us. It's yep. fitness industry. And so turning that back around to how do we take performance from you know, like from a training perspective to that that business side, you know, you, you've touched on the motivation and goals and I really want to get on that process part because you have to start these processes and you have to seek these processes. And you know, I don't think that middle management should be afraid from trying to push these processes up up the wall as well and saying, hey, I listened to Tony the other day on this podcast on body science and I think it'll be great for our business. And that's what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is like that change is is really difficult, but you're, you, you've got this process where you've been from sport, you've done your MBA and you've landed in corporate, which I think is the dream run, just so you know, between you and me. <laughs> but And we'll talk about that work-life balance and what you think of that soon. But I want to get into this process is all that matters. Because uh, when I read that, I went, oh, what does that mean? Because nobody really, really deep down goes, gee, can you throw some more processes at me and regulate me a little <laughs> bit more? I just want a few more things. I, I, you know, stay in my lane just a little bit more. Make the lane a bit thinner, will you? <laughs> like, and so- what, what do you mean by process is all that matters? So in that, I'm not specifically talking about work processes, yeah. but it does apply to work processes, mm -hmm. right? So if we think about this, every great coach that I have ever worked with, and I'll give you a, a, gr a really good example. So the first game I went to when I worked with the Broncos, Wayne Bennett's coaching, we go out, we win by about 10 points, I'm going to say. We go into the dressing sheds afterwards. Wayne Bennett, absolutely tears strips off these guys. Like, I couldn't believe it. We just won this game. And I'm sitting there watching this admittedly grumpy kind of fella just go absolutely nuts at these guys. And at that point, all I could really think of was, this is what he is like when we win. Imagine when we lose, right? So anyway, a few weeks go by, we front up to another game, this time we lose, and we lose by about the same margin, about 10 mm. points or so. Going to the dressing room after the game, I'm expecting the mother of all blow-ups. And instead, he does the opposite. He talks about how well they played, about how they executed the process, about how they executed the strategy, about their error rate, about all these great things. And every great coach that I've ever worked with does exactly the same thing. Because often the outcome is out of our control. Yep. Right, The outcome is often out of our control, but what we can control is the inputs. Right, We can control our process, which is let's stick to this game plan. We should make this percentage of tackles. We should keep our error rate down to this. And if we can do that, then we've played a really good game. And if we get beaten by another team, it could just be that that team is better than us or yeah. we got bad calls from the ref or something like that, but we can only judge ourselves on our process. Yeah. And in the fitness area, I think this is, in training in general, I think this is so important. Important because if we tie our 
motivation, our self-worth, our good feelings to our outcomes. And let's say our outcome is, I want to lose weight. Well, we know that that goes up and down, right? We know that I can get on the scales today and I could do everything right and get on the scales in three days time and maybe go up by 300 grams, yeah. right? That could happen. So if I tie my self-worth to that outcome, then all of a sudden that self-worth goes up and down, right? It's terrible. So, you know, there's that saying, progress is never linear and it never is in anything. The only thing that can truly be linear is effort. Effort, yeah. right? So it's the work we put in, but it's got to be the right effort, right? And so we have this saying that we use, especially with um, with young developing athletes, we used to use it in sport. And that is just this concept of winners behave like winners, right? So winners do the things that winners do. And this sounds really simple and remedial, but when you think about it, it is absolutely true. If I want to be really great at anything, I should find the people that are really great at it and I should do that thing. And if I can follow that process, that gives me the best chance of getting the best out. Now, will I always get the best outcome? No, my weight going to go up and down. Some days I'm going to wake up, I'm going to feel terrible. Other days I'm going to wake up and feel great. But if I can follow the process and more than that, if I can start to really enjoy the process and the process becomes my goal and the process becomes my motivation, then that replaces just about everything else. And that is what really great performers do in anything, right? And you you know, often we think talk about process and people go to um, Rafa Nadal before he serves, right? Jonathan Thurston before he kicks. We think about that process, but there's there's, there's a process to perform, which is that process. What do I do immediately before I need to do my absolute best work? There's a process to improve, right? Which is uh, I want to get better at my squats. So I squat three days a week. I do these other exercises. Like I have a good process around that. And then there's what I call the process for progression, which is that I know that if I'm trying to lose weight or I'm trying to get sales or whatever it is, I know there's going to be up days and down days. I know that is just part of the process. It's never linear. And if I can understand that, then those down days don't feel as bad. They just feel like they're part of the process. There's a great story about, and and this is probably, this is a good story to tell because something even like creativity, right? So there's a great story about Jerry Seinfeld. They say he wanted to get really, really good at writing jokes. And the problem was he'd sit down to write jokes and a lot of them would be bad. And so he'd get upset about that. So he wouldn't write. He'd only write when he could find good jokes. And he said to someone one day, he said, this is stupid, right? I know a percentage of my jokes are bad and a small percentage are good. So I just got to write more bad jokes. Right, <laughs> And so what he did is he he decided that every day he was going to spend two hours just writing jokes, didn't matter what they looked like. Wow. And he knew that out of that would pop some good stuff, right? 90% of it's going to be terrible. 10% of it's probably going to be good. So he'd just write every day. And what he did was he had like an annual calendar and he'd just put a cross through every day he wrote jokes. And that became the process. And as he went on, the motivation, if you like, actually just became putting the cross in the box. Yeah. Can I tick off another day? That's what ends up motivating us. And when that can motivate us instead of the outcomes, then we can kind of, if we can find a good process, then we can just about do anything. Yeah. I love that. I love that. You spend a lot of time in that part working with corporates? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Okay. And can there be, can there be multi-tailored processes within a division? Yeah, there absolutely can be, you know, and there'll be processes, you know, the stuff I was just talking about with processes for, for an individual, individual. or the thing that they go through, right? Yeah. But we also, I suppose, got to understand that at the corporate level, we've worked out the winners behave like winners thing. And to do this thing really well, we follow this process. Now, part of that process should also be, hey, let's stop and think if we can do this better every now and then, right? And then that gives people that kind of, I think, a greater ownership of over the process. One thing I've one thing I've really learned in the last 10 years is 99.9% .9 of people want to do a really good job, want to do a really, really good job. No yeah. one really wakes up in the morning and goes, you know what? I can't wait to go to work and do a really crappy job. Yeah, Pretty much that. everyone wants to do a good job. And to your point before, you have a lot of people that say, Say they don't like work or don't care about work, you know, that nine out of 10 might say, I don't really care. But if you gave them the option and you said, you could leave work today and just feel pretty blah about it, or you could leave work and think, you know what, I had a really good day. I achieved some things. I feel like I added value. Most people would pick the second one, right? Yeah, exactly. So if we can show them how to, the process to do that, then most people will, will start doing it. Again, it re usually represents the harder thing. So there'll be some struggle with that. Yep. Um, and we'll have to push some people through that, that process of doing that. But 
but most people will opt in. Okay. So, man, if somebody wants to reach out to you and work with you, how do they find you? So, my company is Performance Lab. The site is performancelab.com. There is just, you know, inquiry page there. We've got a heap of um, information, blogs, uh, vlogs. Um, from there, you can go to a, um, we have like a store where you can buy the focus planner, but we also got a ton of free downloads, like things like self reflection templates, goal setting templates, things yeah, like nice. that. So, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can pick up. And before we finish, mate, let's talk about this word work life balance. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think it, people approach it wrong. I think the biggest thing about work life balance is no one really has a definition for it. And like anything, if we have no benchmark or no definition, there's an excellent chance we can't achieve it. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you ask most people, if you say, would you like more work life balance? They would say yes. If you say, what does that look like? They'll say something like, I'd like to get home earlier a couple of days a week or not work on the weekends or something like that. But, you know, if you if you get home earlier a couple of days a week and spend the next two hours scrolling Instagram, probably not really work life balance. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So having a real understanding, a re- really good definition of it for yourself. And once again, when what we teach is, you know, it's it's managing those areas of work, home relationships and self. And it's understanding things in each area that make a really big difference and focusing on them and not worrying about the rest of the stuff. Right. Because the reality is we only have a certain number of hours in the day and work is infinite. Infinite. I I had a, a conference the other day, 400 people, and I said, put up your hand if you could work the next seven days straight for 20 hours a day and still not get everything done that you'd like to get done. And every single person put their hand up, right? And so and so this is the biggest problem because I say that work-life balance actually starts at work. It starts with at the start of your workday going, you know what? What can get done today and what can't? What are the things that really matter? And can I get those things done? And what are the things that just aren't going to get done? Because there's stuff that isn't going to get done. And so if I can narrow it down to that, then I can actually finish a work day, right? If I can say, this is what a good day looks like. I get these things done and I'm realistic. Then at five, six o'clock, whatever it is, four o'clock, hopefully, I can go, you know what? I did those things. Yeah, My work day's finished. Wins, yeah. yeah, I feel good about that. Yeah. Unfortunately for most people, what happens is they get to four o'clock and there's still a hundred things on that list. And so they never, they either never leave or they leave late or they never feel like they've actually ever finished. And it stops them from disconnecting from that and going and looking after the other parts of their lives. But if we can work out the big things at work, the big things in home relationships and the big things in self, and I know that today to move each of one of, the, one of those forward, here's what I'm going to do. Or this week, you know, here are the things if you want to spread it out over a week, then I've got a really good chance of getting work-life balance because I actually know what it is and it has a process. Yeah, I love that. What a great way to finish the podcast. Mate, thank you so much for coming on board. It's uh, it's really good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, mate. And um, we'll keep selling nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I really appreciate it. Once again, if someone's looking for you, they can grab performancelab.com.au. That's it. And your Insty. T-Bone Wilson one. T-Bone's a name I picked up when I was working with uh, the Australian baseball team. We yep. had an American coach. There were three Tonys working for the team. Someone got T-Dog, someone got T-Bird, and I got T-Bone. Nice. I like it. So, mate, thanks for coming on board. Hopefully, uh, we'll catch up again soon and do some cool stuff at Body Science too. That'd be good. Sounds good, mate. Mate, I love it. Thanks for coming on board. Awesome. Thank you.